assembled behind me to my right. Norm Hodson, Sarah Bjornsson, Simon Richards, Doug Warnell, and on my immediate right, Jennifer Fix. It's a great privilege to be here today. We're going to do three things. First, we're going to touch on some of the core attitudes and passions that we'll bring to this project from our experience and from what we know about the project so far, which isn't all that much. And second, we're going to move through with the specific questions. As, the other as you know from the other teams, we've been asked to respond to very specific questions in this process. Last and most importantly, we want to have a, at least half our time for a question and answer. We want to hear from you about some of your passions, your concerns, and your hopes for the project. We're going to have at least that, and Jennifer Fix will be our host for this. So that is really the important part, is the conversation with you. In terms of our passions for the project, we want to term it in, in, we want to use three terms to guide a conversation. Respect, regeneration, and responsibility. First respect. The first respect we have that's crucial is for the voices of you at the student body. Um, we've done a lot of this kind of work, and this is a co-design process. We obviously have our interests, we have our beliefs about what works and what works less well, but our, our, the crucial thing we bring is ears to listen. We have respect for the voices of others. There's people who know this campus really, really well, um, the administration. But the other thing I always think about in this process, I like to talk to the people that are going to clean our buildings, as an example. Like, what's it like to clean a round wall versus cleaning a square wall? There's real practical aspects of this that, not, that need to be represented at the table. Most importantly, we have a lot of respect for the work that's previously carried out. Can everybody hear me OK at the back? Good, OK. Um, uh, if I lose my voice, I'll go back to the mic then. Um, the, uh, you last saw the team from uh, Endel Elliott and Goose County Marlar, and they've done a really enormous amount of work on the Lauren Davies Complex site. If the core solution that's right for everybody in this room and everybody in the rest of the campus is embedded in the work, then that's the solution we'll use. We have no attachment to having the right ideas being our idea. We want the right ideas to be the right ideas for everybody in the long run. Regeneration. This is a chance to create a place for regeneration of the body by supporting health. Good food is essential, health and wellness. It's a place for regeneration of a campus. Part of the question we'll ask ourselves and we'll work with you on is how is it that even if you never enter the building that this can make the campus better? How can it make the linkages between the campus pieces better? Regeneration of the planet. We're completely capable of doing a high level green building. We do them lots. But that's not the central kind of conversation that, that's exciting to us about sustainability. The central conversation is how can this be a sustainability hub? How can it create a place so that the conversation between, say, a student from Port Coquitlam and a student from Malaysia could really learn about what doing a green city is about and come back with the tools and the response and the ability to do that more effectively? And that fundamentally, the role of a building like this as a sustainability educational catalyst will be really much more important than whether we have the perfectly designed energy efficient building envelope. We like to do that well and we will do that well, but that's not the crucial goal. Responsibility. We'll be responsible for your money. We recognize you're paying for it and we'll never forget that. We'll be responsible to the current students and future students. In having a, in having a referendum, you've chosen actually to, uh, to give an enormous gift to the future, and we recognize that. We'll be responsible to all SFU campuses. Obviously, this place is on Burnaby Mountain, but how can it be a hub for a network of campuses? We'll be responsible for quality and durability. Too often forget, and the building has to last well. We'll be responsible will be responsible to passions we can't imagine. We sometimes think of this type of building as like a city. And like a city, you'll have parts of it that are very fixed and memorable, and a lot of it that'll be really flexible. And if we're doing a really good job, there'll be ways that this building gets used that can't be imagined by anyone in this room tonight. And fundamentally, we'll be talking a little bit more about this. We'll be responsible for the Simon Fraser community as a whole. Moving on to the specific questions. You asked us about our firm. There are actually three firms represented here. Athletica, represented by Doug Warnell, will be our sports and stadium architect. Cornerstone Planning Group, represented by Simon Richards, will be responsible for facility programming. 
and the rest of us are from Dialogue. At Dialogue, we've been passionate about building this place out for many years. Our firm was founded by Norm Hodgson, and the early, earliest important project was the design of Granville Island. This project is embedded in our DNA because it speaks of the importance of integrating public ur urban design, building design, in to create a truly public place. And fundamentally, a new student union building has to be a truly public place. One of the smaller lessons of Granville Island that's important is the food is also pretty good. If you don't have good food in a place like this, people won't come. As an all-Canadian practice, we're passionate about this country. We're passionate about Canada. The social and geographic diversity of this country is reflected in great places of learning, like this one. Importantly, as an organization, we're not a corporation. We're actually a partnership. Fundamentally, our structure is about people interacting with people. And lastly, some of, us may, some, of us, uh, some of you will know that we're currently designing a new student union building for a university that uh, we don't talk uh, about here. <laughs> you asked us about our people. The crucial people are everybody on the stage behind us. Myself and Norm Hodson would be the principals in charge. This is my long hair phase. As my hair gets grayer, my hair gets shorter. I've worked, I, I've actually lost track of the number of university campus projects and what we call student quality of life projects that I've worked on. Um, in terms of hobbies, I used to have hobbies and now I have children. <laughs> Norm Hodson, um, in his fabulous 60s wear, um, Norm has far too many university projects to list. Um, and his particular passion about integrating urban design and architecture has been enormously inspirational to me personally. And he still plays mean hockey. He plays way better hockey than I do, and I'm jealous. Sarah Bjornsson would be our central key day-to-day -day contact for the project. And Sarah is particularly passionate about the rigor of building good buildings. And we can't forget that. We have to build something that's going to solid and last and be beautiful. Um, she used to play rugby and beat up in the clan, but uh, she doesn't do that anymore. Doug Rennell, who's probably the only person I know who wore a tie as a student. Um, I don't even wear a tie now. Um, He's our sports and stadium architect. And Doug um, has taken his particular passion for sports and architecture and combined them in a, in a wide range of facilities, both indoor and outdoor. And he uh, still runs vigorously. Simon Richards, who clearly wins the best looking guy in the 70s. Um, I, again, I'm slightly jealous of this. Not maybe of the collar, but certainly the hairstyle. Um, and Simon is an extraordinary resource because his experience of working with groups um, to create the, exactly the right facility program, the contents of the building, is unparalleled. He brings an extraordinary win wisdom to that exercise. And he's done it tons of times before. Jennifer Fix, and you'll see Jennifer in the last half of the presentation, she will be our student engagement lead. And her, she comes from the planning side of our firm, so she's had tons of experience working with the public in all sorts of different types, types of, of, of areas. So moving on to that one, she would be, Jennifer will be the primary representative of the students during the consultation. And by that we mean she's going to be the coordinator. She's going to be the person to make sure the meetings get organized, the information is carried forward properly, that there's continuity and consistency. All of Norm and myself and Sarah will be at the key, the, the absolute key student engagement events to make sure that we really hear directly from you what's important. Simon and Melanie, who's not here from Cornerstone, will be digging very, in a, both for a very high level into a very detailed level of facility program. How many outlets do you need in this particular room? That kind of conversation which is important to excellence. And as I mentioned, Simon brings a great wisdom about this process as well. And Doug Rennell will be our sports and stadium and the liaison with recreation ath athletics. But fundamentally, we'll all work as a team and any one of us can have the ideas and input at any level. That's how we always work. In terms of a process, this is the process we put forward on our proposal, but uh, I'm not gonna go through it, through it again. This is only a template from our past experience. The first thing we would do is sit down with you, we'd look at the schedule, we'd look at the budget, we'd look, what are the key moments that we have to talk to you? What are the key ways that we can do that effectively? What we expect is that there'd be formal and informal events. Um, there'd be large scale events such as open houses and small scale events such as small focus meetings. We use the term broad and deep engagement to characterize that difference. 
We certainly expect we use social media and a dedicated website. We've done that previously. Design brainstorming workshops. And we'd certainly want to have on-site extended work sessions and drop-in sessions. You'd asked us about the synergy. I'm missing one of my pages. You'd asked us about the synergy between recreation, athletic, and student activities such as clubs, government, and how this could play out on different sites. From this perspective, it's only one comparison, which is the Lauren Davies complex and other sites. And it's hard to uh, it's hard to see in this kind of winter image, but there actually is a possibility that this could provide a blend of sport and leisure and sport and culture. So that each time a, vi a student visits this, a sub and stadium complex, a student could grow more aware of other activities in and around the complex, including recreation and athletics. So the idea would be that students would have the opportunity to visit and develop a socially, socially and physically healthy lifestyle. And the social and physical health of the student contributes to the social and physical health of the campus. That's the way it works. The other sites actually have enormous wins, but this is the one site that has that particular advantage, that particular opportunity for synergy and cross-programming for efficient use of facilities. There are many facilities and room types that you can use by both recreation and athletics and by student uses. If we do this right, you'll see unexpected things start to occur. Perhaps, I didn't know this existed, but you can actually do chess boxing, for example. You asked us about our understanding of the purpose of a student union building and the benefits it could bring to the Simon Fraser University campus. The purpose of a student union building, in our view, is to improve the quality of student life, bring people together, and allow them to express their passions to each other. And I'll say that again, because getting this right is actually really central. The purpose of a student union building is to improve the quality of student life bring people together and allow them to express their passions to each other. If we create the right framework for that to occur, we'll be a successful, we'll have done a successful job. Both Norm and I have worked for Arthur Erickson, the, the architect of Simon Fraser, and we're respectful of, of his vision, the idea of a campus that was integrated physically and academically. And we can't forget, we should never forget what an invigorating vision that was originally, and what it still is, and a radical vision. But the student inhabitation of this campus obviously lacks a focus. It lacks a focus, it lacks a, a sense of warmth, a sense of home. These were the three things that you want to do as part of Build SFU. Respectfully, we would suggest that community should fundamentally move to the top. Because really, community is the purpose of what we're trying to do. And the sub and the stadium are part of that. So what will happen then is we'll ask ourselves in conjunction with you, how can we build community even during the design process? How can we build community prior to the building's doors opening? Because most of us won't be around at that point. Most of you won't be around at that point. So that's essential and important thing. And if we're successful, and we have every, uh, every belief we would be, a new student union building would fundamentally create a new heart for Simon Fraser University. Thank you. We'll move on to Jennifer Fix, who's going to coordinate to us, uh, the, some questions. I'm sure you have some questions for us. During the time that Jennifer is coordinating, and, and we'll all be responding to questions, we, we have a slideshow of just some of our past projects. Great. So now this is the real fun part of the evening where we get to tap into the wisdom in the room here. So my job as a facilitator is to get as many questions as possible from you over to this uh, broader team. So we're going to keep our answers as concise and as brilliant as possible so that we can move through as many questions. So uh, let's just begin by having a show of hands, folks who, who have questions to pose the team. Yes, sir. Maybe I'll take a stab at this to start with. I, to me, it's a balance between the two. I mean, architecture unto itself doesn't create community. What we find in our work is that the building is like a support or a prop almost, and you need, you need supports for things to take place. But the activities and so on within the building 
will actually come out of programming, come out of student ideas, come out of events, clubs, and what have you, RNA and other activities that are housed within the building. So to me, it's, a, it's an interactive process between the supports, which is the architecture and its extensions, and the actual uh, functional uh, programming that would take place on, uh, really by the, by the student body, by the student government. Uh, Simon, I know you'd like to answer that question. Too. Oh, just to amplify what Norm says, I think uh, uh, the building that's wrongly conceived can impede activity, but basically buildings support the activity that people want to have in them. So I think buildings facilitate. I think students and other people come to the activities that are in them, but I think buildings provide a very important support. And buildings can inspire ideas about activity that may or may not otherwise uh, materialize. Yes, yeah. sir, in the front. time he leaves, what's the time frame there? How much time would you spend in consultation with the students? Would it be a month, two months? Then from that point on, can you give us, all of us, uh, an idea of what the length of from beginning to opening the door would be? So for the folks who didn't hear in the back, you're, you're asking about the overall planning horizon from, be yeah. Well, I can, I can start that conversation because often we're <laughs> short answer. The, we're, we're often engaged before the architects are. In, in this case, it's an integrated process. So in fact, the, the consultation can overlap with the design process. And we think there's a lot of merit in that. And it's our preferred way of working. In terms of the programming, which I kind of specialize in, it's impossible to do a meaningful project in less than three months. You just can't mobilize a number of people. On the other hand, you really can't stretch it over more than seven or eight months, or the people who responded early, there's, there's sort of a loss of continuity in the project. Uh, with, with a student uh, situation, there's the semesters that have to take into account. So I would assume there would need to be a fairly intense organization of the co consultation activity around that schedule. And that probably means getting going pretty quickly before you know, this semester ends. Um, but I think our process at the pre-design will interlap and overlap with the design process. And I think that's a strength that our team brings and it's embedded in our process. Yeah, I, th thank you for making that last point, point Simon, because it's really critical. Um, we don't see a, a line between consultation and then design, or sorry, programming and then design. We really want to do an integrated um, method on this so that we'll be designing when Simon is still programming spaces and the beautiful thing about that is we can test his recommendations and see whether physically we can actually come up with a great um, design out of the constraints that, uh, and, and the uh, numbers that he's providing. A further, uh, I think, part about this one is the fact that uh, we'll be working within an existing building, uh, assuming that the Lauren Davies complex uh, sort of passes all the tests in terms of structure and so on. Uh, we'll be working within uh, an existing framework that's already out there. That makes it even tougher because we now have to fit program, conceptual design, and, and uh, a set of existing constraints and bring that all together. Um, but I, I would say um, that the design process, the programming and design process, will probably be about um, five months, probably five or six months. And uh, I would imagine that we will be consulting with students all through that phase. And likely, uh, when we get into the working drawing phase, which could be in the order of another five months, that there will be additional points of contact to ensure that uh, people are abreast of exactly the progress of the, of the detailed design work as well. To, how long it'll take to build, I honestly don't know at this point. But uh, it will, I can assure you, it will be at least 18 months. And to build on Norm's point about engagement, at the project outset, we'll be working closely with the students to identify a student engagement plan um, to get a really good handle on what are the priorities for students, what are their expectations around being consulted, and then to craft um, a strategy to best reach out and tap into those insights and perspectives and priorities. The fellow in the back.
Okay. So let me just try to repeat that. How would we integrate, how do we handle or approach the fact that there are three different campuses, okay, that need representation in this one building? Uh, I, I actually don't think we know the answer to that absolutely clearly. I'd be a liar if we did. There's obviously a lot of advantages in things like social media. I think the programming will be important. Like I think there has to be some really key events that take place at this building that will bring all the campuses together. But I think it's actually something where we very much want to look for ideas from you as well. Like I want to really understand at a detailed level how someone who does all their classes in Surrey, for example, thinks of the Burnaby campus what would bring them up here and to make sure that's embedded in a building diagram? And I, I don't think we know really clearly what the answer to that is, though. I, I think that's right. I mean, we've been asked this question twice, and I'm not quite sure we have the right answer to this one. Um, but it extends more broadly than that. There are students here that are paying for it now for building this later, and you're the beneficiaries of building other people's paid for. There are different constituencies on the campus. So the idea of engaging all of the key players who are going to fund and use the building is of primary importance. And the one about remote campuses is obviously very important, um, and it may in the end um, have an effect on how the building's designed and particularly how the programs that the building is conceived can actually be appealing and in, w in some ways uh, be made more relevant to the campus, the other campuses. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting issue. The fellow in the cap. Good, very good point. So let's tackle the first question, uh, which is a, around student potential student touring of existing b buildings. Does someone want to take that? Well, it's a great idea. I mean, I can tell you that when we start on a project, uh, particularly if it's a type we've never done before, the very first thing we do is take a tour, uh, whether it's in a bus or an airplane or however we do it. And uh, it's a great experience because you really get to see how other people have have done it and you can talk to the people who run those facilities and you can find out what's working, what's not working and so on. So uh, sure, I would encourage uh, that if it's possible, if it can be paid for, I mean there's issues around doing it obviously. Um, but there are a number of examples that we're showing on the screen that are local so it, you know, it's not so hard to get to the local uh, 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 post-secondary institutions and have a look at what, what's been done there. Um, in terms of the other one, I like the second uh, transit uh, exchange better because I've been designing that new community up there for the last 13 years. So it's, I like going up to that end of the campus. But I, I think the, the great thing about this, this site, the proposed site, is just the symbolic uh, point of arrival. The fact that when you first come into this, into the transportation exchange area there, this complex is on your left. It's integrated with the landscape and the play fields. It has very high visibility. And uh, it, um, I, I just think it's a, it's a great opportunity for the student union building to kind of raise its profile, raise its identity, be more iconic. And if we do it right with great outdoor spaces, uh, activity areas outside, and uh, Doug can tell you all his ideas about how to design the stadium so it becomes an extension of the actual indoor activities of the sub, it'll be a great uh, new heart for student activity on the campus. So, I, you know, and if there are a few steps to get up there, I wouldn't worry about it. People need exercise. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yes? Um, what about accessibility when it comes to the big chair? What happens if someone's in a wheelchair? Physical accessibility. Yeah. And in general, in all, all through the design. Okay, universal design. Well, the great thing about the existing site is that actually it, there is a fairly benign route to get people up from sidewalk level. So I'm pretty sure we can uh, handle any issues around, the, uh, ar around those that are physically challenged. But, um, you know, it, it, it kind of begs the question about where's the front door? And uh, it's a very interesting complex because it has this kind of duality about the front you sort of think is facing the field or to the to the uh, to the entrance of the campus and yet you know people are kind of wandering around through parking garages and little kind of alleyways and coming in the back and it's kind of dark and narrow and I, I actually think the interface between the Lorne Davies building and the parkade and those other academic structures um, to the north is a really critical part of the design of this building if we could actually make that a better place make it a connection east-west in that part of the campus, create a, a kind of a nice interior street or an exterior uh, muse or whatever, whatever we come up with, I think that would be a great addition that this uh, project could actually make to doing a little bit of repair to a part of the campus that isn't working very well right now. Other questions? I know the question that's on everyone's mind, and I can tell you the answer is that Bruce likes long walks on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Yes. That is an excellent question, and it's something we struggle with in a lot of our planning processes. How, how do we get those um, hard-to-reach audiences who may not be, may not have the time or the ability to engage? And so what we do, we take, Bruce mentions we have two approaches to engagement. One is broad engagement, and I think this is, it applies to your, your question, and that is we cast the net very broadly so that we um, reach out to people who have limited time, for example, so online surveys, is, is not very demanding. It appeals to people who aren't unable to attend a three or four hour session. Um, we also often go out into the community, uh, high traffic locations with a, a booth, for example, information booth where you can grab people as they're walking by and give them a pamphlet or, you know, p uh, grab their ear for a couple of minutes to, to get some input that way. So uh, reaching out to the community in a kind of meaningful way is, is one way that we get those hard to reach audiences. Another idea that we've had that's been very successful in past projects is where we actually embed ourselves up in the campus. So one of us would actually be designing up here. We have our own space. We'd have our computer, trace paper, and so we'd actually be physically working here so people can come in, drop in, see the design evolving, come up with suggestions. And so by actually physically being here, we can actually kind of through osmosis pick up more ideas that might not be necessarily broadcast in a more broad strokes net kind of thing that you were just mentioning. So physically embedded quite help. It starts to understand the DNA as a, of SFU and how this campus works. And then students get to know you as well as a result. Exactly. Right. Anyone else want to follow up on that? Just uh, um, uh, Tahi, when we did the, this process at uh, UBC, it was actually interesting that the informal drop-in process, one of my favorite conversations was a security guard who said he'd actually much rather have somewhere safe for students to sleep in because currently they were kind of hiding in corners and he didn't know how to take care of them properly. And if there was actually a room where people could sleep during exams, it would be a huge win for them. And that was a kind of informal thing. It wasn't an example, a student-specific example, but it gave us a different lens. So we've got 10 seconds left. So we want to just close by thanking you so much for taking the time to spend uh, half an hour with us to share your insights and to ask great questions. And we just want to leave you with um, an assertion that we, we we care about and we aspire toward making really fantastic places and we'd be absolutely thrilled by the prospect of working with you to determine what that means for SFU. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, then you got this. All right, so thank you to Dialogue. Uh, thanks thank for you. presenting. And thank you to everyone here for coming.